Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode, a special episode of Market Watch Mondays. I am your host, your Capitan, your guide in this adventure. As you can see, it's Super Bowl Sunday, the last game of the season, officially kicking off the Dynasty offseason after today. You see me, I got my jersey, I got my Brady jersey, repping from back in the days and the Patriots, I wear it every Super Bowl, uh, you know. Thankfully, because he's been in like almost half of them, it, it's not actually silly that I wear it every Super Bowl. But I'm wearing it this week, especially because I'm rooting for him, man. I, you know, I think I think it'd be an incredible story for him to go and and just win the first year with another team and in, in a completely different division, uh, new coach, new squad, new everything. Uh, him being the ultimate difference maker there, uh, because I, you know, I love Patrick Mahomes too, and I think Mahomes gonna win a ton of them. So, and he's still young. So, you know, I wouldn't shock me at all if Mahomes himself went on to win like six, seven Super Bowls and eventually take over the GOAT title from Tom Brady. But for now, I think it'd be a great Cinderella story, a nice little upset. I actually like the uh, plus three and a half spread on the Bucks um, that people were getting. I myself, I don't bet on Super Bowl days anymore. I used to back in the day, uh, you know, made some money doing it. But it was just like it was just like a little bit too like stressful, took away from the fun. You know, I just want to really enjoy the game as it is. I do all my betting in season. Uh, I do all my fantasy in season. Once that stops, I kind of just stop and just enjoy the game of football. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I may not be a film grinder, but I'm a lover of the game and I love watching the game through and through. So that's what I'm going to be here to do, doing today. I'm recording this episode right now before the Super Bowl uh, because once the Super Bowl starts and even leading up to it, I got to go and make some food. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try out a new queso recipe uh, that I found. So I went out and got some cheese and some sausage and all that stuff uh, inspired by partially by, by, by uh, Mike Wright from the Ballers. I saw him and then also uh, Polly Sleepers. He had a little twist of the cream cheese. I'm going to try that out. Never done it before. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but, you know, I, I figured I'd record this episode before because, you know, I don't think I'm going to cover too much that goes on in this game uh, in terms of players. I'll, I'll just briefly mention a couple of the relevant uh, fantasy ones before we kick off in the main topic. But, you know, as you know, it's a strategy session. It's another strategy session. We don't rely on the games on Market Watch Mondays because our strategy is all seeing, man. It is It permeates throughout the entire offseason. It permeates throughout all players. I'm trying to teach you the ropes of how to play the game versus really just how to pick out players all right so without further ado man y'all know what time it is but yeah hit that intro baby as you guys saw we have a brand new intro for Market Watch Monday. It's not brand new because it's still based on that same scene, the Wolf of Wall Street scene, uh, my favorite scene in the probably in the entire movie, to be honest with you. Uh, but uh, someone was nice enough to reach out to me. Uh, his name's Tony. Uh, I don't have his Twitter handle on me right now. Let me see if I can find it real quick. His his Twitter handle is at seven deuce bias bias e. I, I don't know. It's seven d e u c e d b i a S E. So Tony DeBiase. So I'm sorry, dude, if I butcher your last name, Tony, my man, Tony, I'm going to find out how to say his name so I can say it right next time and give him the credit where it's due. But he went out and just made this intro for me. I, I didn't ask for it. He just DM me one day and it was there and I opened him the DM, I opened up the video. I was like, dude, this is freaking dope. I cannot wait to use the market watch Mondays. He's actually also helped us out with the NBA top shot intros. Uh, so if you guys are watching the NBA Top Shot videos from Noah and myself, the sick intro there is also courtesy of my man, Tony, just, uh, you know, doing doing the Lord's work, man, helping us out. I am not a graphics guy at all. I'm not artistic in the least, which is why I just had that intro. I thought it was simple. I thought it was nice to fit with my show. But now with Tony in there, he's got the drum beat going. He's got the nice video edits. He's got the nice cutaways. He's got the bunk bed breakdowns. Mark Watch Mondays in there. Nothing but love for you, Tony. Appreciate you. Thank you. I cannot thank you enough, man. You know, I, I just, you know, the community is, is, is an awesome place. You know, Twitter is a toxic place and there's a lot of stuff that goes on there, but every once in a while, man, you got, you got great guys like Tony reaching out out of the blue, volunteering his time, his sweat, his dedication, and his care to provide us a cool intro like that. So just want to give him a shout out. Thank you, Tony, if you're watching. Hopefully you're watching if you enjoy the show. Uh, but yeah, thank you for that. And I'll, I'll get your I'll get your last name, man. I won't I won't butcher it next time, I promise you. I'm gonna go with Tony DeBiase. 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 I'm gonna try that for now. Let me know if that's off. It's probably off. I'm sorry, I butchered it. But let's move on to some discussion about football. All right, so today's game. I mean, I don't think there's gonna be too much comes out today's game. We know who the players are. I mean, 
I think Mike Evans is, is going to be underrated again. He's underrated every year. He went, you know, he went for a low yard of the season, put up 13 touchdowns. I actually thought he had an outside shot of being wide receiver one because of his touchdown upside. I thought he was one of the wide receivers that had t- double touchdown upside with Tom Brady. Unfortunately, the yards wasn't there. He was hurt all year. I mean, he was playing with a hamstring injury the entire time. So I'm looking forward to a full healthy season with Tom Brady and Mike Evans. And I know a lot of people fading him because of Tom Brady, because Tom Brady can't throw deep, blah, blah, blah. Like that's a bunch of horse shit. If you look at the advanced stats, Tom Brady... His yards per attempt gone up. He's one of the he's one of the highest like deep ball throwers, and Mike Evans one of the one of the best deep ball catchers in the league. So it's a match made in heaven. I think they're going to continue their magic. And if Chris Godwin leaves, I mean that's going to open up even more volume for Mike Evans because uh, he's already elite. This is not a vacated targets thing. This is Mike Evans just being good. He's going to be good, and he's going to be the guy that that Tom Brady trusts. Uh, I think Antonio Brown might actually be back. So you know if you're on a contending team. I think you probably get Antonio Brown pretty cheap, and I, I kind of like Antonio Brown going forward. I mean, I think he's still a decent enough like cheap drop throw. A future bona fide Hall of Famer, obviously. Um, in my opinion, he's like the second coming of of Marvin Harrison. Uh, to be honest, he's a modern. Uh, I guess Marvin Harrison wasn't really older in times, but like he's like the modern day version of Marvin, Marvin Harrison. So I could totally see him producing a little bit. Uh, the other relevant people we want to talk about Chris Godwin. I mean, wherever he goes, he's going to be good. I think you know. I but I think you know. Is there a risk that he goes somewhere and is forced to be the wide receiver one overall the team? And that kind of like changes things for him because he's had the luxury of having a Mike Evans opposite him. Maybe. But I do think Chris Godwin's just really good. So uh, hopefully he doesn't like go to that juju trajectory where like, you know, he became the one and then wasn't as effective. So we'll see where he goes. I think, you know, if he lands in like a big place like Green Bay Packers plays alongside Devontae Adams, that'd be pretty cool. I think if he goes to... You know, the Cardinals plays alongside DeAndre Hopkins. I think both those were pretty cool because both those teams, I think, can support a couple of different wide receiver ones. Uh, even if it goes like San Francisco, you know, DeBrand Ayuk on the outside, Chris Godwin on the inside. I think that's a pretty interesting duo as well with George Kittle there. But we'll see what happens. Um, I'm a buyer of Chris Godwin. I'm a buyer of a lot of these free agents, uh, Allen Robinson as well, Will Fuller as well. I think I think they're just really good wide receivers. And wherever they land, they're going to kind of have that opportunity, right? And then the others on the other side, Actually, before we get to the other side, we also have Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones is someone that I've never been high on uh, his entire career. But this year in particular, I took a I took a flip and, and I actually went and grabbed him in a couple of leagues because he was so cheap and he was so hated on. And people thought that for sure, for sure, Keyshawn Vaughn, for sure, Keyshawn Vaughn, the, the, the old, old prospect with, with a bunch of holes in his profile was going to just come in and dominate out the gate. Keyshawn Vaughn, not relevant, right? And then when Leonard Fournette switched over, for sure people were certain Leonard Fournette was going to make Ronald Jones relevant. For sure. They were they were absolutely certain. It's those certainties where you can find value. So I ended up getting some Ronald Jones. I think that Ronald Jones has proven that, you know, from what I've seen, he's the best running back in that in that backfield, right? He's, he's outrun Leonard Fournette. He's outrun, I mean, obviously he's outrun Keyshawn Vaughn, who barely makes it on the field. But I think Ronald Jones is an interesting play. He's a lot of risk, though, because we don't know what's going to happen next draft. Maybe they take someone else and are not happy with him. Uh, but I think, you know, if you have Ronald Jones, wait in a hold and see what happens. Because, you know, if he if he plays a full healthy season, there's going to be a high score on offense. I think he can he can put up some respectful numbers. And he w- he did put up some respectful numbers in the games that he did play. Obviously, he's a little bit more boom bust. He's not an elite pass catcher. They like getting Leonard Fournette in there. We don't know what's going to happen for it after this you know i hope they win a super bowl too i mean good for leonard Fournette, dude going from you know a lot of like negative press to cut from his own team uh, to getting hated on to being a backup to ronald jones to barely make it on the field uh to now in the super bowl and it was a big big contributing factor in the last game so shout out to uncle lenny uh, good luck to you guys i hope you guys win i'm rooting for brady i'm rooting for the team but that's all we got for player analysis for now i don't want to cover too much of the chiefs other than the fact that you know Mahomes is elite travis kelsey's elite tyree kills elite mccall hardman fade him still and then I guess the last piece is Clyde Edwards Alaire. I think he's a buy low. I think his price warrants it. I think he's still a pretty good running back. He's not elite. He's not going to be like that top end guy like we thought, but he started getting receiving volume towards the back half of the year. Um, traded off for goal line volume. So, you know, that upside won't be there, but just given how people are treating him, I think he's a he's a pretty good asset to have in Dynasty still. And, you know, I actually like him at his price. I think I'm pricing him at about a mid first and super flex drafts. I think you can probably get him for that especially when the time comes uh you know javante williams the guys on the board uh people probably prefer them to cloud of and depending on where javante williams williams lands that'll make the decision for me but for now i mean i think i'd rather have Clyde edwards Alaire, regardless of what people think like the chiefs are still the chiefs and i think he hasn't really had a fair shot yet um given given injuries and levy beyond levy on bell and all this stuff so yeah i think that's a good buy um buy low so go out there and grab yourself some clyde edwards hilaire all right, the topic I want to cover today, I tweeted about it a little bit. I'll just throw it up on the screen. 
But I think we need to normalize thinking about the game in terms of expected value instead of hit rate, right? Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, you know, uh, you, people are talking about hit rates. Like, oh, I have a 50%, 60%, 70% hit rate. And how they define hit rates for most, at most points is like hit rate for a wide receiver is one top 24 season, right? One top 24 finish season. That's considered a hit, right? And then for running backs, one top 24, one top 12, whatever. For tight ends, maybe it's like top 12. For a quarterback, maybe it's one top 12. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is like we need to like kind of diverge from that way of thinking. I, and I've kind of alluded to this before in my prior videos, but, you know, not all hits are created equal, right? Why was I so in on James Robinson? And not to make this another James Robinson video, I just think that he's a very good example of how to illustrate this in practice, right? A lot of people are fading James Robinson and we're fading James Robinson all the way throughout the year because he was a low percentage hit, right? Because the chances of him hitting were low because he's an undrafted free agent. They had no investment in him. The team is tanking. And now like it's almost a certainty that he's going to get replaced in the draft, right? And you know what? Those are very, very legitimate risks. And I've never hid behind those risks and said, hey, look, those risks are not real. They are very legitimate risks. But at the same time, the hit on a James Robinson, the impact that you, he can have on your team is just so much greater. Like people are flipping him for like late end first, right? And what do you get? Like maybe a wide receiver there, a nice wide receiver, even like a, like a, you know, a, a Jalen Waddle, maybe like a Seth Williams, right? A Deami Brown. And look, those guys, you know, maybe they do hit. They have like a top 24 wide receiver season, right? But the impact on the team is just not going to be as high as if you hit on James Robinson. So if you think about... Like the way, the way you think about it is expected value. The way I think about it is expected value. And what is expected value? The expected value is the odds of someone hitting multiplied by the impact of them hitting. And that creates a value for, for, for that particular player. For the most part, I think dynasty players and everyone, the norm is to just think about it in terms of the first part, just the odds of hitting. What is my chances of hitting on a player? And that's, that's what matters most. But we're completely ignoring the second part, right? The impact of the hit is what really matters, and that determines wins and losses, right? You know, a top wide, top 24 wide receiver season is nice and all, but it doesn't really change the game. I mean, wide receiver replaceability is so high, especially now with this new influx of talent, more influx of talent next year. Like, there's so much wide receiver talent. You, They are like a dime a dozen, right? But running backs, it's not the case because – no matter what, like you, you, people are playing like wide receiver threat, uh, wide, three wide receiver sets, quarterbacks going for 4,000, 5,000 yards, you know, 30, 40 touchdowns, like quite regularly. But there's only like one running back on the field at a time, unless you have like a couple of like a dual back set. But for the most part, there's only one running back on the field that has the lion's share of the opportunity of getting become relevant so they're more rare they're more scarce and the, the difference scoring differential between the running back like the top running back and the running back five and the running back 12 and like the running back 24 is much much more sparse and much much more sparse and scarce than the wide receivers so you really need to start thinking about the impact of the hit and that's why i swing on guys like james robinson because if i hit on a james robinson that hit the expected value of that hit even though the percentage part is lower far 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 outweighs the expected odds of hitting on a wide receiver and you know it's really hard to quantify right because there's no there's no great way to quantify this and i've been trying to think about it and like but sometimes like you just sometimes you can't get too bogged down by the numbers like to me this type of thinking makes sense like this this type of thinking really aligns with like chasing upside and we know upside is what wins fantasy leagues and what wins championships right so if chasing upside is what matters like how do you quantify upside to me, upside is the second part of that equation. It's the impact of the hit. And if you're not accounting for the impact of the hit, then you're not really chasing upside. You're playing it safe. And, you know, that's that's fine. And that's great if you're in a rebuild mode, right? Like I always talk about it. You should always be playing for value only in a rebuild mode. You don't want to take major risks. But if you're trying to win and you're a true contending team, like a top-end contender, the differentiation between a top-end contender and a mediocre team and what people think are contenders is that it's so you're so clear that you're like leaps and leaps and bounds ahead of the competition that you're in like a tier of your, your own with like maybe one or two other teams right those teams the ones that win in the end are the ones that swing for the goddamn fences if you don't swing for the fences you're not going to win right I, I, I you know i put up the drake meme all the time on twitter but like you know that's the point where i'm willing to lose trades i'm willing to lose trades 
in the hopes that it helps me win a championship and provides me that edge. And the way you get there is really focusing on the second part. Now, I'm not saying go out there and freaking draft like Henry Ruggs, right? But at the same time, like I think when it came to Henry Ruggs, people just totally misquantify the impact of his hit, right? Henry Ruggs hit, he has a low odds of hitting. And to me, he had a low impact of hitting, but people thought he had a high impact of hitting because he would become the next Tyreek Hill, which was obviously, you know, hilarious right there there is no next there is no next Tyreek kill so stop stop chasing that unicorn do yourselves a favor just just take that remove that from your head and park it and lock it away in some some like virtual storage that you never look unlock again because the the surefire way to burn draft capital is to try and chase Tyreek kill there's only one of him he's a goddamn unicorn and just appreciate him for what he is all right but yes so chasing upside really comes down to the impact of the hit and i think a great way to quantify impact of hit is war Right. And for those of you guys who don't know, it's wins above replacement. And it, when we look at wins above replacement, it's why I don't really focus on drafting zero RB a lot. Like wide receivers do not provide you meaningful wins above replacement player. Whereas the most, the, the position that creates the most war wins above replacement is the running back position, uh, in my opinion. So there's a guy on Twitter. His name's uh, Stathole Sports. Let me see if I can find his tag for you guys uh real quick here but he he has i think he works over at dynasty nerds i think he's a great follow personally um but he wrote a pretty detailed article his name's jeff henderson his tag is at stat hole sports so s-t-a-t-h-o-l-e-s-p-o-r-t-s so he wrote a really cool article about war and how he quantifies it how he how he calculates it you know a lot of people have different ways to calculate it but i think that is a good starting spot for how do we think about impact. And so, you know, when we think about the EV and trading off that Im that impact, there's two ways to think about it, right? One way to think about it is within position, like within position groups, right? So that's like, you know, I want to hit on a top five wide receiver, top three wide receiver, the guys that actually provide you a point differential that matters versus I want to hit on uh cross positional which is what i was talking about like hey the impact of hitting on a top end running back a top 10 running back far outweighs the impact of hitting on a top 10 wide receiver just based on point differential scoring alone so those are the two ways to think about it. i think right now it's very it's hard for people to really think about it within position right because we don't have we're not that great at, at like forecasting like that type of scoring differential there's because there's so much variance in the game but i think what we can do is based on metrics like war right you can quantify the impact of running backs and quarterbacks and tight ends even versus that of a wide receiver so that's what i think about it when i make when i make about when i make those types of trade-offs right where do you swing right and it's the same same concept i apply to dynasty and drafting as a whole like people always say like, oh we should go zero rb because it's anti-fragility uh you know players get injured less and blah 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 blah, blah. but to me that's always been a weird way of thinking about it because like hey that's like you're playing for the 80th percentile outcome. You're just hoping to outlast the field, right? You're hoping that running backs get injured. You're hoping that you're like your backup running backs you have stashed in your bench, like four or five run replacement level players are going to be able to get starting reps because someone ahead of them gets injured. That's the hope for zero RB. That's the only time that zero RB succeeds, right? But if you are to go up against someone that drafted like heavy RB in the beginning, right? Like have, has two or three workhorse running backs and then value wide receivers later, those two teams at 100%, give me the freaking workhorse running back 10 times out of 10, right? Every single time because there's a greater impact. If you can have a Barkley plus a Dalvin Cook, which is a very realistic scenario when it comes to startup drafts this season. If I can have a Barkley, Dalvin Cook, like a Barkley, Alvin Kamara open to my draft, give me that all day over two wide receivers. Like wide receivers, like don't repeat that often anyways, but the impact of wide receivers is just not that high because like yeah, I'm sitting there in the fourth or fifth, fifth round, sixth, seventh rounds. I'm going to be getting guys like Robert Woods. I'm going to be getting guys like Allen Robinson in the fourth. I'm going to get guys like Mike Evans in the late third. Like I'm going to get guys with high ceiling, high, uh, high upside plays at wide receiver that are just not going to exist at the running back position later. So applying that same type of mentality of like thinking about in terms of expected value. Yes. The running back might have a lower odds of hitting because of injuries, right? Because of shelf life and all that. But when they do hit, the impact is just so much greater. And I think that's that's the way that that we really need to start thinking about the game is not just in odds of hitting, but expected value. And you know, it, it, someone else, Cooper on uh, on fantasy on uh, Twitter, sorry, Cooper, what's his what's his tag here? Sorry, I should have looked this up before I started, but 
you know, sometimes I just go off the whiff. So at Cooper under DFF, one of my one of my favorite follows on Twitter. He's a really smart guy. But he he raised a question like, hey, like, you know, we're not really good at calculating expected values yet, and and that's totally fair. That's totally fair push. Like I said, we don't know. I think I think it's it, we have a a decent starting spot with WAR, but because we're not good at it and it's not commonly accepted means that we're not really great at calculating expected values. You don't want to make too many like massive decisions based off it. But also at the same time, I think that means that this is like a this is a space that's like very ripe for disruption. You know, you can test stuff, you can play around and the mistakes aren't going to cost as much because no one really knows they're doing yet, right? Everyone's going to be making mistakes. So, as long as you apply the methodology and use analytics as a base to kind of give you that first part of the equation, which is the percentage odds of hitting, then like taking your swings and taking cracks at the awe of the impact of hitting part i think like you know it's it's a it's like an outsized risk reward thing where you know you you might you might screw up here and there and i screw up all the time right but you, you swing for the fences and it it really does does give you an, an edge right because people don't think about it that way and i'll give you another practical example right with rookie drafts coming up how do we apply the concept of expected value to rookie drafts right the way i apply it to rookie draft and the way i think about it is when I'm going for running backs, like people always say, like don't draft for need, whatever. Like I think that's a, that's a bunch of bogus because like at some point you got to consider it. But if you're a rebuilding team, you don't have to consider it at all because you don't have to consider values. But like at the same time, I consider positional needs and I consider positional value, positional relative impact in rookie draft. So early on in the draft, I'm much more likely to swing on a quarterback in superflex, obviously, and a running back than I am a wide receiver because. Yes, the wide receiver can hit. Yes, Jamar Chase is is you know could be generational, and I don't think he is. But yes, like let's say he is generational, but the impact of him hitting is just not as great as someone like a Najee or an Etienne or Javante Williams. Now, I have Jamar Chase in his tier of his own, so I'm going to take him ahead of an Etienne and probably Javante Williams as well. Um, but when it comes to the next tier of guys, like I'm probably going to land somewhere. Uh, of prioritizing running backs and quarterbacks like i'm going to prioritize a trey lance maybe or a or a zach wilson uh potentially one of them even over jamar chase to be honest with you because when i'm thinking about it like yeah do they have a lower odds of hitting based on the profile alone jamar chase is very very high odds of hitting and someone like a uh, Najee harris because of his age or someone like a trey lance because of his one year they have a lower odds of hitting so if, at that first part of the equation i'm going to give that to jamar chase right jamar chase checkbox odds of hitting i don't think there's many that are higher than him but when it comes to impact of hitting like unless jamar chase goes out there and has a justin jefferson like season you know i'm not saying that's not possible but i'm not i'm not really betting on it unless he does that the impact to your team is just not going to outweigh that of a Najee Harris becoming like an RB1 or that of a Trey Lance uh, taking over as a starter and becoming and unlocking the Konami code and becoming like a top 10 quarterback like Jalen Hurts, right? That the value above the wins above replacement for those players are going to be much higher. So that's how I think about it in terms of impact. And that's how you should think about it too, right? There's no perfect quantitative way to think about it. But if you just think about it from like a, I don't want to say common sense, but just think about it from a common sense perspective, like, who are the ones that are contributing to your wins, right? Is, is it the wide receivers on your team or is it the running backs? Now, the one part that this doesn't consider, though, is value, right? The value portion. And and that's that's the next part that I want to talk about in the segment a little bit, right? Like people think about their ranks in terms of hits of like, you know, number of top 24 seasons and where they finish and stuff. I think for Dynasty, it's a totally different game, right? The way you should think about your rankings and whether or not to hit is is whether the value increases year over year whether where you have them ranked accurately reflects where that value goes the next season. So that's where the impact part, I guess, doesn't have as much of an impact, but it, but it does have an impact in terms of the value of your team. Now, over time, if you accumulate enough value in your team, you're going to win championships. But the key is once you get to that championship contending state, you're willing to take those risks to trade off value for impact, right? That is that is the key. Like a lot of people that just consistently, consistently accumulate value, they're all about value the entire time, but you never really make that push. You never really get that W, right? So you accumulate value for sure as you're rebuilding and whatever. But once you're ready to make that push, you got to make that jump, make that swing and go for the fences and go for the freaking W, right? That is the name of the game. So that's that's kind of what I want to cover um, this week. It's, it's a little bit of a shorter episode. Uh, 
I intentionally want to keep it short because I don't want to get to the game. Uh, but I think this topic, I just wanted to create a video on itself, like the impact of expected value. And, you know, as we get smarter, right, as analysts get smarter, as we develop, as I develop my process as well, as I get more quantitative on this side of thinking, you know, I'm sure we'll have a better metric for expected value going forward, right? There'll be a better way to quant quant uh, quantify it. Maybe it's a combination of analytics plus war, um, war for like that position group, right? To see like what that means for a certain prospect coming in. You know, we'll still refine that stuff, but I think I wanted to get the conversation started. You know, it's not refined. I'm not complete. But I wanted you guys to start thinking about it that way. And when you're on the clock and when you're in the rookie drafts, when you're in your dynasty draft, start thinking about those trade offs. Like, hey, should I be taking this wide receiver who I think is a high security uh, top 24 season hit? Or should I take a swing on someone like a James Robinson where. You know, there's a there's a there's a good chance, or there's a significant chance that he gets replaced via the draft. But if he doesn't, then you're looking at like an Arian Foster type scenario where he's a league winner for a couple of years to come, right? Those are the types of processes and the thoughts that you should have as you're going through this stuff um, to kind of better yourself and just just have a different way of thinking about the game, right? I mean, not everyone has to think about it the same way, like you know respect to everyone that has like that hit rate approach and you know mitigating risk and all that stuff, um, but like. You know, there's more than one way to win the game. And and my way is not the best either, right? This is just how I play. This is how I think about it. It's not necessarily the best way to do it. It's just the way that I think that people should approach the game. And, and it's not done enough, right? Maybe more and more people do this and then the edges are raced. But for now, based on what I've seen, based on my experience, based on the game that I've played, I think there's a significant edge to be had for people that do think about it in terms of expected value and for people that don't ignore that second part of the equation, which is the impact of the hit because at the end of the day we're chasing upside we're trying to get that w and we're trying to get you a championship not one year but for year after year and really build that dynasty man that's what this channel is about that's what i'm about so if you enjoyed make sure you subscribe hit the thumbs up button uh follow me on twitter and give me a shout out man i'll, I'll uh i'll try and comment back and we have some back and forth and just just talk football man talk football talk trash talk whatever you want to talk just holler at me on twitter holler at me in the comments i try and get to those as well when i can um but yeah man thanks you guys for tuning in hope you guys enjoy the super bowl hope you guys have a good time just enjoy the game man it's the last game because after this is going to be rookie hype season all month long and we're going to have you covered on the bunk back breakdown channel so make sure you follow us um hit up noah as well on twitter we got a lot of stuff coming your way and if you guys are into nba top shots like i said man we got the nba top shots video coming out this week we didn't do a weekend one because we figured people are gonna be watching the super bowl anyways and we'll have more talk about uh come the actual regular in in week film so make sure you guys tune into that as well all right that's all i got for you guys i'm out let's go brady you're the goat man hopefully you take another championship home, man. Good luck. All right. Have fun with the game, y'all.